welcome to the course Introduction to Urban Planning. Continuing with our efforts to cover related act in the domain of urban planning, we shall cover two specific acts today. First being Contonement Act and then the second being Heritage Related Acts. So our coverage of section 1 will include contonement, understanding of contonement, looking at the difference and the spread of the contonement areas across the nation. Then we'll look at the key aspects as per the URDPFI guidelines. Thereafter, we'll look into particular act, Contonement Act of 2006. We'll look into key definitions, what it uh, prescribes in the act. Then we'll look at the contonement boards, the various categories which are identified duties of the board, what all they can do, taxes and fees which they can collect and the town and planning and control over the buildings they have. That all will be covered here. Accordingly, the expected learning outcomes are that after completion of this particular section, you should be able to differentiate the contonement area and describe its spread in the country. You should be able to identify and review key aspects as per the URDPFI guidelines as well as you should be able to identify key elements based on their definitions, authority, categories, duties, tax and fees. Uh, you should be able to further review their town planning uh, responsibilities as well as the control they have over the buildings. In the section 2, the coverage will include the Ancient Monument and Archaeological Sites and Remains Act of 1958-2010 and subsequent revised on 2017. We will look at the Heritage City Development and Augmentation Yojana or RIDE by the Environmental Protection Act 1986 as well as we'll be looking at Delhi Urban Arts Commission Act of 1973. So we'll be looking at uh, based on this uh, ancient monument and archaeological sites and remains act, you'll be looking at the key definitions. Uh, how do we really define ancient monuments, antiquity, archaeological sites and remains, protected area, protected monuments and then we'll look at what are their implications as you may recollect that in the first lecture we talked about why there is need for act. So you may look at the implications of this act. After completion of the section you should be able to list and review the acts. You should be able to identify and review key elements and aspects based on the definition, ancient monuments, antiquity, archaeological sites and remains. You should be able to identify the protected area, protected monuments, and then you should be able to review what its implications would be. You may simultaneously think of the court case I mentioned in the introductory lecture of the series as well as look at many other cases as suggested in the readings and the watch. Moving on to section 1, Contonement Act 2006. Trying to understand first contonement. Contonement means a military garrison or a camp a permanent military station usually of a large scale where men are trained for military purpose. You must have visited contonement area or lived beside it or lived, you must have lived in a contonement area. This unique structure of contonement boards is being ma maintained successfully keeping in view the fact that the contonement areas were are primarily meant to accommodate the military population and their connections. Contonement are different from the military stations in that the military stations are purely meant for the use and accommodation of the armed forces and these are established under an executive order whereas the contonements are areas which comprise of both military and civilian population. So as per the Directorate General Defense Estate, there are 62 cantonments in the country. You may see in the map how are they spread across the country and most of them being on the northern side. The link to the list is also given to you in the suggested reading and watch if you want to see all of them here. Further in the map, you can see Lucknow Cantonment area 
You can see the map of Delhi cantonment. It occupies 43 square kilometer in the heart of the metropolitan region as shown here. These areas are very similar to the urban areas. That is what we are trying to understand in terms of their requirements for urban management and governance. So we have all across seen those urban management and governance and all the issues. The major difference in cantonment area, unlike other ULBs, are that the urban self-governance of the cantonments and the housing accommodation is subject matter of the Union of India. The overall municipal administration of the notified cantonment is the function of the cantonment board which are democratic bodies like ULBs. So you have seen how ULBs are the democratic bodies, similar way the cantonment boards are also democratic bodies here. The Ministry of Defense on June 23rd, 2021 has issued the draft cantonment plan administration rules 2021. There is also the cantonment bill 2020. For the purpose of review of Act and also to understand the implications and look at the various definitions, we will look at 2006 Contonement Act. The purpose of this Act is to combine and amend the law relating to administration of contonment with a view to impart, so what is the intention, impart greater democratization. So you have also seen in 73rd and 74th Constitutional Amendment Act. The purpose was more democratic system of governance. So here we look at the greater democratization, uh, further improvement of the financial base to make provision for development activities and for matters connected with all these cantonment areas. So as per the URDPFI guideline, following aspects of the act are important for us to understand from the urban and regional planning point of view. So we'll look at what are those selective ones here. As per the Act, we need to know that central government can declare any place or places along with the boundaries in which forces is quartered or which is required for the service of such forces to be a cantonment and can also declare that any such area shall cease to be in cantonment by notification in the official gazette. So any place can be cantonment and can stop being cantonment by the notification in the official gazette. So you may take note of this, how do we really notify it or identify it? Furthermore, we can see that central government can define the limits of any cantonment. The central government can, by notification in the official gazette, direct that in any place declared a cantonment Atonement under this act, the provision of any enactment relating to self-government other than this act. So they have power to have more orders in the place. So a central government can give additional direction apart from the provision under this act. Further, we see that they also have the rights to alter the limits of the cantonments. The Cantonment Act 2006 prescribed that for any local area, can be included or excluded in the cantonment by the central government by notification in the official gazette. If any objections uh, has to be raised, so you see there's a provision for objection. So any objection that has to be raised by an in inhabitant of the cantonment or the local area in respect to this um, notification can uh, do so within a certain period. The period prescribed at this time is eight weeks from the date of notification. It can be even further ahead of that given that it is acknowledged by the government. So for the purpose of planning, we see that any area can be declared or cease to be cantonment, even part can be declared or so, and there can be directives in addition to the act. The boundary is also determined by the central government. There is provision to raise objection as well for the people affected by these notifications. Further, we'll quickly browse through the Act. So we see that uh, uh, there are definitions and delimitation of the cantonment. There's uh, details about the cantonment boards and their elections, members, employees procedure. They also state about the control they also specify the duties and discretionary functions of the boards, uh, what kind of taxes they can imp 
pose and then they are responsible for preparation of plan and then the control over the buildings. So there are many other responsibilities. I have just selected few of them to be discussed here in very brief. So uh, briefly looking at the selective definitions and delimitation of the cantonment we see that the civil area so you must have heard about civil area so civil area as per the act means an area declared to be a civil area by central government under the subsection what you're looking at this as the civil area further we see a uh, civil area committee is also formed which is the committee appointed under this particular uh, provision further we see there's a uh, uh, term command which means one of the commands into which India is for military purpose for the time being divided. So as per the national policy where all uh, how they are dividing the areas so under which area it falls. Further we see that it also defines defense estate circle means one of the circle into which India is for the purpose of defense estates management for the time being divided as per the policy. Uh, looking at the definition of the cantonment, we see that it provides the definition under subsection 1 of 3, which we have already seen through the URDPFI guidelines. We also see that the Act states its power to define the boundaries of the cantonment in subsection 2 of 3. Further, in subsection 3 of 3, the Act states that the central government shall constitute a board in accordance with the provision under the Act. Furthermore, the Act also provides structure for cantonment board under Chapter 3, Section 10. You may pay attention to the structure and also see how it is different or similar to our urban classification as per the Census of India. So as per the Act, for every cantonment, there shall be cantonment board. Every board shall be deemed to be municipality under clause. So the purpose of the board, so why they have constituted the board, so you can also align with and see the urban local bodies, uh, how we had uh, seen earlier. So you see that the purpose of the board is for receiving grants and allocations, implementing the central government schemes for social welfare, public health, hygiene and so on. Further, you see that board will have the perpetual, which means continuous power to acquire and hold property both movable and immovable and uh, and it will also have the right to contract and the board can um, sue you and can be sued uh, for this particular uh, duties which they will perform. We shall pay attention to this structure similar to the urban classification we see here four categories namely category 1 of the cantonments in which the population exceeds 5000. Category 2 cantonments in which population exceeds 10,000 but does not exceed 50,000. Category 3 cantonments in which population exceeds 2,500 does not exceed 10,000. Category 4 cantonments in which population does not exceed 2,500. So these are the classification which you would like to remember. For the purpose of categorization, the population, how they are categorizing it, uh, so, for that purpose, the population is stated to be calculated in accordance with the latest official census or if the central government undertakes special census for this. So, they can take it directly from the census or they might perform their own special census for this purpose. Moving forward, we see that Act states the duties and powers of the board as you had also seen for ULBs in 12th schedule duties of the board, it shall be the duty of every board so far as funds allows to make reasonable provision within the cantonment for uh, lighting the streets and the public places, watering streets and other, the other public places, cleaning streets, regulating offensive, dangerous or obnoxious streets, uh, then um, also removing on on ground of public safety, removing anything which is considered unsafe for the people, 
then securing or removing dangerous buildings and places, acquiring, maintaining, and changing and regulating places for disposal of dead. So that's also their responsibility. Constructing, altering, and maintaining streets, culverts, bridges, like you saw in the ULB's case as well. Also planting and maintaining trees on the roadside and public places. Furthermore, providing or arranging for sufficient supply of portable water, registering births and deaths, very, very similar to the ULBs, uh, preventing and checking spread of dangerous disease. The health also is taken care here. Uh, furthermore, we see that maintaining or supporting ho public hospital is also under their duty here. Likewise, we see that they are also responsible. The list is long here. We also see that they are responsible for assisting primary school and also the fire uh, safety here as well as uh, protecting light and property when fire occurs. Uh, further, we see that they are responsible for maintaining and developing the value of the property. They are responsible for establishing and maintaining civil defense services, preparing and implementing town planning schemes preparing and implementing plans for economic development and social justice. So we have seen all the different, different range of such kind of plans. Uh, they, are, they are also responsible for naming and numbering of streets and premises. Uh, so you see all uh, these uh, duties they have. They also uh, are responsible for uh, giving permission for construction of building and then also organizing, promoting or supporting cultural and sports activities and so on. So these are uh, the long list of the duties which uh, the cantonment board has. They may also impose taxes and fees. They have general power of taxation to collect like property tax, tax on trades, professions, calling and employments. Uh, in addition to tax uh, taxes, board may also impose tax as uh, per the municipality in that particular state. The board can also charge fees such as license fees, fee related to maintenance, processing charges like they are also approving buildings and then they can also charge fees for betterment. Now briefly looking at town planning and control over building. So you may also uh, slightly pay attention to this. Board, uh, as we saw, is responsible to prepare land use plan. They are responsible to uh, prepare zones for various uses. So we'll be also looking at these uh, zoning uh, tool. So they are responsible for creating various zones. They need to have improvement schemes for areas considered substandard. They are required to publicize the land use plan. So you have seen that whenever the plan is developed that needs to be communicated to the people. So they also need to publicize it. The board also sanctions permission for building. You may pay attention, no person shall erect or re-erect a building on any land in a cantonment in an area other than civil area except with the previous sanction of the board or in a civil area except with the previous sanction of uh, the officers involved. So in this section, section 1, we saw cantonment area, key differences in the spread of the uh, cantonment in the country. We skimmed through the selective parts of the Cantonment Act 2006 and looked into the definition, uh, looked into the board categories, duties, taxes and then the plans they create and the control they have over the bodies. So you can re uh, connect it with whatever we have been seeing in the um, other parts uh, of the urban areas. Moving on, the next part of the lecture, we will look into heritage conservation and legal requirement in particular national level concerning planning domain. Heritage is important and as per SDG target 11.4 specifically calls for strengthening efforts to protect and safeguard the world's cultural and natural heritage. It is important to be aware of international uh, conventions and the national and state laws relevant to the protection and conservation of the art and cultural heritage of a country. You may also recollect that we have also done one particular session on culture and urban planning. Uh, at the international uh, level, you see in UNESCO, 
Convention Concerning the Protection of the World Cultural and Natural Heritage 1972, which makes it necessary for India to take measures to identify, protect and conserve its cultural and natural heritage. At the national level, some of the listed acts include the Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Sites and Remains Act of 1958, which was revised in 2010 and subsequent revision in 2017. We also see uh, RIDE under the Environmental Protection Act of 1986, then Delhi Urban Art Commission Act of 1973. Now, let us discuss about the Ancient Monument and Archaeological Sites and Remains Act of 1958 under Legislative Department, Ministry of Law and Justice. So, according to this particular act, the ancient Monument and Archaeological Sites and Remains Act is an act of parliament of the Government of India that provided for the preservation of ancient and historical monuments and archaeological sites and remains of national importance for the regulation of archaeological excavation and for protection of sculptures, carving and other like objects. It was passed in 1958. An Archaeological Survey of India ASI functions under the provision of this act. We may note that all archaeological activities in the country by ASI are undertaken as per the provision of Ancient Monument and Archaeological Sites and Remains Act of 1958. As per the law, uh, the protection is for the following heritage sites, monuments, archaeological sites and sculptures. Now we'll look at Amendment Bill of 2010. Ancient Monument and Archaeological Sites and Remains Act of 1958 was amended in 2010 to strengthen its penal provisions to prevent encroachment. So you, you, you may recollect in our discussion that there had been a lot of encroachment in these areas. So in order to prevent that, the penal provision, prevention of encroachment and illegal construction close to the monuments which was happening on a large scale. So for this purpose it was revised as a result of increased pressure of habitation especially in urban areas. Protected monuments and sites were getting shortened in from all the sites. This affected their safety, security and aesthetics. So, uh, the main feature of this particular revision was that it declared the prohibited area which was like 100 meters around every national monument where no construction, public or private is permitted. Then you also have regulated areas around 200 meters beyond the prohibited area where any construction requires permission of a newly constituted National Monument Authority NMA. Given the unique nature of each monument, the act also proposed heritage bylaws for each monument to be prepared by an expert body. Now, we'll look at Amendment Bill of 2017. Uh, Lok Sabha uh, passed the Ancient Monument and Archaeological Sites and Remains Amendment Bill 2017 to allow government to take up infrastructure projects uh, within prohibited areas around protected monuments. So, now they could uh, do the infrastructure projects around the monument. The bill amends the Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Sites and Remains Act 1958. So, bill authorizes the central government to allow the public work based on the recommendations of the NMA. The bill authorizes NMA to consider an impact assessment. So, it will look into impact assessment of the uh, proposed public work, the kind of work which will be done at that place in the prohibited area including its archaeological impact, visual impact and heritage impact. As we had covered before, heritage city development and augmentation Yojana Ride, which uh, we have seen in detail before, we see that uh, this was done under the Environmental Protection Act 1986. The Environmental Protection Act EPA was enacted in uh, 86 with the objective of providing protection and improvement of the environment. It empowers the central government to establish authorities charged with the mandate of preventing environmental pollution in all its form and to tackle specific environmental problems that are peculiar to different parts of the country. The act is one of the most comprehensive legislation with a pretext to protection and improvement of the environment. Article 49 of the constitution 
we see deals with the protection of monuments and places and objects of national importance under the directive principles of the state policy which states that it shall be the obligation of the state to protect every monument or place or objects of artistic or historic interest to be of national importance for spoilation, disfigurement, destruction, removal, disposal or export as the case may be. We also see now moving on to Delhi Urban Art Commission. It's a statutory body formed by an act of parliament in 1973. It was established in 74 with an aim to enhance and maintain aesthetic beauty of the national capital um, Duak, uh, Delhi Urban Art Commission is meant to advise the center on matters of preservation, development and maintenance of aesthetic quality of capitals, urban and environmental design. So any redevelopment activity in places of historical importance must have the Duak approval. These include Jama Masjid, the Red Fort, Kutub, Humayu Tomb and so on. Uh, looking at some key definition for this, we are referring to 2017 Act. Ancient monument, uh, now you may pay attention, ancient monument means any structure, erection or monument or any tumulus, ancient burial mound or a place of interment grave, tomb or any cave, rock sculpture, inscription or monolith which is of historical, archaeological or artistic interest and which has been an ex existence for not less than 100 years. So these all include ancient monument. So you can see how the ranges are to declare ancient monument. You see that it also includes remains of an ancient monument, not only just the monument but the remains of it, also the site of ancient monument, also the portion of land adjoining to the site as well as the means of access to the site. So all these constitute the ancient monument. You further see that it defines antiquity. You might look at the uh, uh, detailed uh, definition for this. Furthermore, you may see that archaeological site and remains are also defined, which means any, any area which contains or is reasonably believed to contain ruins or relics of historic or archaeological importance. So that all come under this. Uh, here you may pay attention, uh, protected area. So protected area means any archaeological site and remains which is declared to be a national importance by or under this act. So it is usually notified, declared, so that's how you determine the protected area. Then you have protected monuments means an, uh, an ancient monument which is declared to be of national importance by or under this act. So these you may re remember protected area and protected monuments. Let us try to understand the meaning of the protected areas looking at its implications. So what it implies to the area which would come under the protected areas. So no person including the owner or occupier of a protected area shall construct any building within the protected area or carry on any mining, quarrying and so on. So it takes away their right, there's restrictions on their right. The central government may by order direct that any building constructed by any person within the protected area can be removed. So you see the power it assigns to the government. Further you can see that if the government is of the opinion that any protected area contains any ancient monuments or antiquities of national interest and value, it may acquire such area under provision of land acquisition act. So they can also acquire your land for that purpose. This act also makes provision for compensation for loss or damage to the owner. So you may also get the compensation for this. We also see that the act gives the central government power to declare ancient monuments and so on to be of national importance. So they can declare any of those. They have the power to do though. So act provides the central government right to acquisition in a protected monument. Further, we see that it also gives them the power to enter into agreement with the owner to protect the monument for preservation um, and then also for the maintenance of it. Also, uh, you see that it, uh, the act empowers the central government to restrict the use of owner with respect to um, uh, the owner cannot like uh, really uh, 
to charge any fee for entry uh, into the monument or destroy or remove the monument or build anything around the site. So uh, you may see that uh, there might be a little conflict with the rights here. Then it also uh, empowers the government to allow access to public and, uh, or any officer to inspect or maintain the monument. Furthermore, uh, if the owner wants to sell the adjoining property, central government has the right to purchase such land or any part of that land. It also makes provision for appointment of an authority to decide any dispute arising out of an agreement. Uh, there's also an arrangement for settling the dispute. In case owner is unable to take care of the monument, then also certain arrangements are made. And then there can be also acquisition of protected monuments here by the government. So this was what we covered in uh, section two, summarizing um, this section. Uh, we looked at the ancient monument and archeological sites and remains act of 1958, 2010, and subsequently we saw 2017. We saw the environmental protection act of 1986 through which the RIDEP is done. Then we see Delhi Urban Art Commission Act of 1973 and we looked at the various key definitions. So these were the references used for this purpose. Uh, you may also look at the suggested watch and readings. Our coverage was limited with the scope to make you aware of the topic. There are enormous readings and movies available to explore. Few are suggested here. This is not an extensive list. You may feel free to suggest more from your experience. Please feel free to ask questions. Let us know about your concerns you have. Do share your opinion, experiences and suggestions. Looking forward to interacting and co-learning with you while exploring cities and urban planning. Thank you so much.